everybody. I'm absolutely thrilled that there are so many wonderful students, um, both undergraduate and graduate here tonight. I'm delighted that we are also welcoming this evening our future new board chair, Doris Doni, who's sitting right there. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Beatrice who is our guest of honor tonight, and whom I will introduce in a few moments, and her husband, Didier, who is also our guest tonight. And we happen to also have with us a special guest tonight, Irina Schaefer, who is the mother of the Georgian Arena Schaefer Center for the Study of Genocide, Human Rights, and Conflict Prevention. Who knows where that is? Everyone. Right, good. That's good. That's good. So anyway, we, we are thrilled to be able to be here tonight to sort of share this very, we hope, kind of informal presentation slash conversation, which very quickly will open up to all of you. Feel free to ask any questions. Um, I'm thrilled that there are a lot of male students here who are not scared, and staff members who are not scared away by the title, <laughs> Women Entrepreneurs and Having It All. Um, this event is co-sponsored by the International Business um, Administration Department and the President's Office. And I'm really happy to see so many future entrepreneurs out there, people interested in in, let's say, future business, international business leaders. I'm here to learn at the knee of a particularly personable, and warm, and generous, um, and very successful business leader. So, Beatrice Cointreau has had a lifelong career in the wine and spirits industry as a serial entrepreneur. In recent years, she has actually devoted herself increasingly to mentoring students, and mentoring young women particularly. In, the, in that industry, sort of lecturing on the joys and the pitfalls of entrepreneurship as well. She's a member of YPO, Young President's Organization. She served for 25 years as president and CEO of Champagne Gosset and Cognac Frappin, and she was also a longtime former board member and director of the Renault Cointreau Group. And she is currently president and CEO of Admirable Malibu Wines, which she's going to probably tell you about, and by B Ventures, and, or BYB, do you say? Yeah, by BC. By BC, by BC. <laughs> and a board member of both Women of the Vine and Spirit the Company and also the Foundation. Now get this pedigree, this academic pedigree. She holds a BA degree from the Institut Supérieur de Gestion, ISP, ISG, and a degree in uniology from the University of Bordeaux, as well as master's degrees in marketing and communications, and also in private and commercial law from the Pantheon. Assess, she also holds an MBA from Cornell's Johnson Graduate School of Management and has completed INSEAD's International Director Program. So I want to know how you also <laughs> raised a family of three boys and addition, in addition had the career that you have. I don't know how you fit in all that education, but I think we can call that a Franco-American education par excellence. Beatrice Cointreau has also received the distinction of Chevalier de la Légion d'honneur. And she is, as it happens, she has wine and spirits coursing through her veins. She is the great granddaughter of the founder of Cointreau Liqueur and the granddaughter of the founder of Rémi Martin. And so what is so interesting is the way that she inherited all that, had all of that on her back, but really forged her own way. And part of what she's going to be talking about today is how you do that as a woman, how you do that as an entrepreneur, and we're going to be moving back and forth between what it means to be a professional and what it means to be a successful um, head of household and mother uh, at the same time, and you should feel free to ask any questions about anything that you're curious about. So I'm going to turn it over to you at this point. We're thrilled to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Well, first of all, I must admit that successful can mean a lot of things. And I think that the main concern we all have, especially when you're younger, is how am I going to have it all? I'm interested by lots of things. I have various skills. I know I would like to forge some of them. But at the same time, what am I ready to lose, in a way? Because the way we're taught, especially in the French system, is you have to choose your battles. So you have to either be a good spouse, a good mother, a good friend, because you need time, uh, an achieved entrepreneur, or whatever your career takes you to. And in fact, my answer from day one was, I do not accept this framing. 
And the reason why I didn't accept it is that I realized very soon that we're all juggling. And life is not just a picture, it's a movie. So imagine you're juggling with, let's say, bottles, and you're turning them into your hands. You always have a couple of them above your head, and if you take the picture at this moment, you feel like it's going to fall on my head. I cannot be all at the same time a good mom, a good CEO, a good spouse, sorry, DJ, but not at the same time. But fortunately, we do not have to be. And it's the same time for men today, because if you look at how the, the society is designed, we are heading for more work at home. So the straps of men leaving in the morning to the office, like in the 19th century, everybody went to the factory to work. And then we kept this way. It's not sustainable, we're polluting. My belief is that, and my view from day one was, we can have it all, but just one step at a time. And of course, it makes more sense for me, it made more sense for me to build on career first and then have children when I was in my 30s and had my last one when I was in my 40s, but that was a big surprise I arrived at the doctor. I think it's premenopause, and she looked into it and she said, no, you're just five and a half months pregnant. I said, sorry, I missed this one. It's not possible, it's year 2000, we're se selling so many prestige cuvee, I have to go to 120 markets. It's a no. And she said, I don't think you have the choice. Well, that's another story. <laughs> there again, do not plan to do everything. At the same time, it won't work. But one after the other. How did I come up to this? I was probably five years old. And in the old time, of course, totally obsolete today. It doesn't happen anymore. But women were taking all the plates and doing the dishes. Well, that's the way I was brought up. And my brothers were following my father, and they were having Stilton and port wines and talking about those great restaurants and hotels they'd been staying. And I was too young to spend all my time in the kitchen. And you have to realize that in the kitchen, most of the conversations were, you know, labor is terrible or my teenager is terrible, whatever. And then I was moving to others, the other side, and it seems paradise, heaven. And I thought, you know what? I want to be in this camp. I don't know about the other one, but they're complaining all the time. It doesn't seem really appealing. I want to stay there. So one day my father asked me, what do you want to do when you'll be a grown-up? I said, I want to be president, which meant CEO, whatever. And I didn't have a clue of what it meant. But all those guys were present of something, whatever, a pub or a social pub. And I thought, I want to be one of them. Didn't realize yet that it might not be as easy as I thought, because I didn't see the difference. And the good thing with the way we are raising our children to, today is that in our society, and you're very blessed to be at AUP, you won't see the difference. You have your pals, boy and girls. Of course, you may be gossiping with one more than the other, but mostly you don't project yourself with any difference. When I arrived at Cornell University, just by accident there again, I applied, my boyfriend did the same, he wasn't accepted, we broke up, I went back. But <laughs> I arrived on the first day, we were, um, having management. And so the teacher featured a movie. And it was great. You know, he said, you have the president, the secretary. What do you think? Let's make groups solve question one, two, three. And for the only time, the full year, we all agree, this president could move his ass. And by the way, the secretary should shut it up. And he said, OK, the four women at the front row, we move forward. Uh, can we? We all froze. And gentlemen, you can leave as well because now we're going to see the movie again. She's the president, he's the secretary. No one guessed 
because I wasn't brought up this way. I was very happy to be a woman and, and brought up this way. I love cooking. We acquired the Cooking School in 1984. It's been a, a, a hell of a journey. Really nice to see that it's international today. But I didn't realize at the time that I could become a CEO. I went there studying management, didn't protect myself. So he said, if you gentlemen are not ready to work for a woman, you can leave the room. And by the way, if you are not ready to rule the world, you can leave the room. Long story, short, but I've learned on that day, I had a mission. The mission was when my mom was raised, she graduated, she was top of her class at HEC, and she had a PhD in law. She raised seven children. She was managing director of Remy Martin, but was never a CEO. I decided on that day I would be the first female CEO from the family, which family roots goes back to 1270. So I embraced the journey, and of course, well, just by accident there again, I couldn't hear properly when I was a little girl. So I had surgery, but I developed my nose, my palate, because life is resilience and you always compensate. So my father kept asking me to sample the wine, which I hated because of the alcohol, but he always said, you know, you're gonna be able to tell me which one I should you know, serve first and second. And he would give me the key of the cellar never to his sons because he knew they would grab the bottles and I would never because I wasn't interested in it. But there again, when you are asked to do something, you want to learn. You don't want to say anything wrong, especially to your father who you admire. So I went to learn about wine. Whether the whole family mostly was in spirit, what drove me from day one was my nose. So I also studied and graduated at Isica, which is in Versailles, a school, European school created by Jean-Jacques Germain. And that's how I came up creating new product. I was telling you about my mission. Then you set your goals in life. It's very important to set your goals. And they're gonna change throughout time because of course, you're not the same at 20, 30. Today, my main goal is to go sailing with my husband, who is a professional, mostly, whether for decades. He couldn't see me on Friday evening or Saturday because there again, I was giving back, being at the Mairie, uh, where we were living, or hosting our importers or distributors on a Friday evening because water shadows were closed uh, on Friday afternoon. And the only way I could learn those people to one day be distributing my product was to host them over a very nice dinner, do what we're doing in certain things, you know, in France, commanderie le content du Médoc or that uh, And they were so proud. They had their pictures when I was visiting them in one of those 120 markets I opened throughout the years. I wasn't home. So how do you pair those with the fact that you're having a numerous family. Well, you, you travel with them, and uh, due to, for example, uh, New Year's festival, or New Year's, you know, Chinese New Year's uh, uh, Mooncake Festival, you have to travel when it's the holidays here. So I would take them throughout the world. Today, they graduated in both France and the United States, one in finance, business, new tech, UCLA, the other one, uh, management, he just graduated from uh, an executive MBA at 28, which is not bad. And the last one is studying business and uh, engineer. So I think they realize that you have to work hard. And to, when you've set your goals throughout those years, you just want to achieve them properly. So how do you make it happen and have it all? You don't sleep. <laughs> but when you're a mother, you learn what you don't sleep mean, whatever you do, so it doesn't matter. Uh, you work resentfully. 
but I'm sure that at AUP you already learned this. <laughs> Things that I missed. I love contemporary art. I love uh, painting. I was driving, driving the children at the Louvre every time it was raining, which means mostly every weekend. <laughs> and it, I had this white card. I don't know if it still exists because now I live in California. But um, and I was taking them there, and I remember receiving a phone call from Alex once, and he said, "Mom, I'm at university, and we have this special event featuring the." Uh, you know, art from Europe. And I'm suddenly realizing they were featuring, you know, different artists and those painters were, uh, those painters and uh, paintings, sorry, were at um, Reina Sofia in Madrid or, you know, St. Petersburg or um, the Art um, Institute in Chicago. And he said, Mom, I'm the only one in the class who has seen them all for me. <laughs> and it's interesting, because suddenly you realize you've been dragging them there. And maybe they were complaining. Of course, not that often, but yes, they were. And suddenly it makes sense. And there again, we're taking different path, because we're going to start learning marketing. And then we're going to start learning uh, business or you know engineering or something else. But then you will want to learn something else. For example, I don't know if you read uh, the results of Davos uh, meeting. What's going to happen? Well, we all know it. AI is going to take uh, a lot of our space. I don't know if you've uh, read there again what happened at CS. I was there all the new tech that's going to be implemented in our lives. It's amazing. It's going to be far more reliable than we think. Second thing, therefore, your EQ is going to be even more important because you're going to be implementing the values. And those values you're going to be implementing into the society through coding or not. That's where, as women, we're not very good at this there only 16% women coding today. Um, and that's going to shape the society, but it's a, an old debate, uh, an, another debate. But it's, uh, it's something that we can be concerned about. Um, so going back to this, it's interesting to see that you will be having the, this society work, walking on two legs. And it's going to be very important. Third thing, sustainability. That's obvious, well, especially when you're coming from the United States where, no, 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 warming climate is not even something we, we can debate about. Oh, sorry. The vine is doing well, adjusting, but we're now harvesting one month before we used to, to do. Um, we are planning to see over 16% of the vineyards covered by water very soon. How do we compensate in terms of providing the wine? Then you're going to be planting other varietals and so on. So that's where it's interesting. And I not only graduated in enology from Bordeaux University, but also to Davis. And UC Davis in California is very interesting because in Bordeaux, I was taught the very traditional methods and you know dating back the Romans and so on. At UC Davis, I was sent as an expert in 1990 when they had uh, the Phylloxera there again, as we had one century before them. And interestingly, we went to uh, Denison, Texas in 1870, exactly, to go and get a rootstock that would be resilient to this insect peaking the, the, the vine. That totally destroyed all the vineyards in Europe. It's something that we have to think, I mean, to remember, because it happened again to, in California, but they reacted very quickly. And what I've learned at UC Davis is that technology can help a lot. Would we make better wines? I don't believe so. Would, will we make more resilient and consistent with consistency uh, wine? We're already doing so. So I, I guess that 
just like the education. It's a complementary education between the French with a lot of general culture, the art, and so on, and the efficiency, uh, the self-confidence that we get in the United States. And you're having this here. So it's very important. I'm pretty sure you have other questions because I've been, you know. Sure. Do you want, do you want to, did you want to show them some yeah, I, I mean, did you, can you just check, but, or, yeah, just make those numbers run and it doesn't matter. I'm not going to talk about those numbers, no worries. It's just to show you where we are today as female. And um, it's kind of interesting because if you're staying in this area, in this university, you will feel there is no discussion. We are building a world 360 degrees instead of 180 degree um, vision. Oops, sorry. Vision. Because um, we could say that ruled by only man, it was only a 180 degrees vision, and now we're adding officially. You may know that in wine and spirit business, women have been evaporating wine for ever. Most of the time, they were only recognized when they were widows. So men would go to war or go and export, and they would gather the crop, make the wine, make it age, and then the father, the spouse, the husband would come back. And at the time, you didn't have a washing machine doing the whole work, or the oven, you know, baking everything. And so it's very interesting to realize that they were very happy not only to welcome their husband, but to make sure that he would do his part. And most of the time, he was doing the outside part. And that goes back to uh, far, far, far uh, ago, because he was the one going outside, you know, trying to find some game and uh, feeding the family while we were staying around to look after the babies in the cave. So mostly, it goes back a long time ago. And only if you were a widow in the wine and spirit business, you were allowed and entitled to stay there. Still, I was the first female to become uh, a member at the Wine Academy in France. I was the first female, uh, what we call dignitary, uh, on stage with all those guys. And it's been, the Aldo de Couto has been created in 1694. So it goes back a long time ago. They, they should and they could have named the women far before me. So it's not being feministic or whatever. It's just I was in this industry for more than 20 years. And suddenly they said, yeah, why isn't she you know, staying with us when we're having all those nice reception and having fun and so on. Also discussing, discussing about how much we should pay the kilo of a grape and so on. So they were very important issues discussed around the table. And I would say I was invited to dinner very often, but not to sit at the table very often. I was invited to the party, but not invited to dance very often. It took a long time. Uh, not that I regret it. It probably allowed me to have more time to do other things. And by the way, I wrote five books, so yeah, I know how to, to, to fill the gaps. But yeah, I think it, it's only coming up nowadays and becoming, it started as an obligation, and I think it's becoming as a nomadism, which is great. But still, we have to keep in mind, it's not the case <coughs> in all the countries. Uh, you have to realize in the world, one marriage out of five is still uh, forced. So some women do not have the freedom to learn, to go to school. Uh, some women do not have the freedom to express themselves. And it's very important for those who have those rights to be able to use it. My mom always reminded <coughs> me that um, 
The right to vote was given in Finland to women in 1911. It only was given in France in 1944. Women were not allowed to have a checkbook by themselves and a, a, a bank account until late 1960. So my mom, managing director of Remy Warren, if she didn't have the authorization of her own, either father or husband, wouldn't have been able to run the government. It's not an easy thing to understand, but when you're raised this way, you suddenly realize it. And for me, raising three sons, it's been very important to make them understand they had to be very respectful. And I was, it's a, we're joking about it with Nicole, but, uh, my second son's uh, spouse, he is doing everything at home right now. She's preparing, she prepared her GMAT last year, she's preparing her exams right now at the university. He's ironing the dresses and everything. No worries. He doesn't see the issue. And to tell you the truth, my husband being a sailor, he's far better at sewing than I am. And just because when you're sailing, sometimes you have cracks and he's very good at it, He's in charge of it. So it's interesting. We, except cooking is me, but we, we have our skills. We should be able to exercise our skills and use them properly instead of doing, okay, you do all this, I do all this. Celeste. Okay. Shall we sit down here together? Yeah. And I'm going to uh, ask you some questions and then open it up sort of to the floor. I hope I took out the right paper here. Um, my mind is going in so many different directions because obviously this is a this is a set of questions that um, we think of as particularly about our generation. We came of age at the time of the second wave of uh, the women's movement, but actually these are questions still for young women today. Um, I was thinking actually on what you just said, how important all the books on women's leadership say that having a father who is enabling and loving and who believes that you, and gives you a sense of belief that you can do whatever you want to do is critical, and so is the choice of a life partner or spouse. So something to think about, the choice of a life partner or spouse, the way that you would interact with each other, the way you would each um, use whatever skills, as you just said, why are both of those things important or not? Well, can I? I'm not sure it works. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Um, I have to be honest. We've been together for 33 years, but reality, after 18 years, I divorced. Because he was sailing all the time, you know, <laughs> America Cup and transatlantics and so on. I was raising by myself almost <laughs> because I felt he was never there. Three children and running two companies as CEO, and was board member of 10 of them, other ones. I was opening 100, I opened 120 markets uh, for the Champagne Company, and same thing for the Cognac Company, except that Cognac is mostly sold in Asia, Russia, whether Champagne was sold in the US, for example, UK, and so on. So, to go back to the topic, at some point I said, you know, we never see each other, we have to divorce. But the good thing is, I, mar I had married my best friend. He stayed my best friend. And the good story is that we went back together 10 years ago, and we married two years ago. So, the, the thing is, be true to yourself from day one. Don't try to please the other, and um, if he become your best friend, or she becomes your best friend, then it's a good match. Then there again, when we used to get married in the 16th century, 19th century, and so on, we wouldn't age as we are doing today. So we can move apart. The good thing is that you can move apart and be responsible human saying, okay, it hurts, but first of all, we have three children together, and second, it's important to realize that when you marry someone who is like you with a passion, you have to respect it.
And there again, it's amazing to see that I've been able to be loved and by someone who respected my passion. And I tried to do the same. And at some point, of course, especially when you have three young children, it may be tense. And it's probably when it, and the reason why it cracked. Try to have teenagers at this time, and it was very difficult. But uh, it's it's very important to stay true to yourself and make sure that you move forward all the time. And then it's going to be the right partner. But you you are allowed to change, <laughs> and maybe have a discontinuous path. I think people often imagine looking at someone like you that your path was absolutely straightforward; that there weren't sort of deviations in it. Were there any moments in your career when being, I mean, we've talked a little bit about the wine and spirits world being pretty patriarchal business. Yeah. Um, were there moments when being a woman was an asset or moments when it was a liability? Did you deal with sexism in the workplace and how did you deal with all of that? I would say daily, but <laughs> I have never been a man, so I cannot compare. Um, I think I have a, a few examples just to, to give you an idea of where we were when I arrived in those different companies. When I arrived in the Konya company, I remember the cell master telling me, oh, Beatrice, you cannot get into the cell. And keep in mind, I already had my analogy degree. You cannot get into the cellars because we don't know when you are within the month. So I don't know, maybe the wines would turn bad. <laughs> And I felt like, okay, he never went to university, never graduated. He doesn't understand the chemical aspect of it, but he's been doing this his whole life. So I have to be very respectful and humble and try to understand where he comes from. Where, well, just because someone told him the same thing and probably said the same thing to his grandfather before him, that was the answer. In Champagne, when I arrived, well, that was the easiest one. It was nine years after um, becoming uh, managing director of uh, the Cronium Company. And um, when they were told I, would, I was becoming the CEO of the company, well, the three main asset, cell master, export manager, and the one in charge of all the French market, 65% of the market, I mean, of the, the turnover at the time, said we're quitting. And I said, why do you quit? And say, we will never work for a woman. So I thought, OK, I don't see how I can project a company. Already, uh, the debt of the company was four times the turnover of the company. And uh, the reason why they placed the women at the time, uh, at the head of the company, my mom summed it up very easily. She said, Beatrice, if you succeed, it's because you're your father's daughter. If you fail, it's because you're a woman. That's what they're going to say. So you'd better succeed. Okay. So at this point, I thought, what can I do? I asked those three gentlemen to go to Konya, be spending 48 hours without me with the people I, was, I had been working with for nine years. I say, after that, then let me know what you think about it. And the three of them said, OK, they seem to love you, whatever, and we're going to try. And 15 years after, when I left the company and resigned, uh, they were crying, and they were still there. The reason why I left and sold my shares is that I, at some point in my life, I faced uh, three surgeries and two radiotherapies for cancer. Speaking about setback. Um, being a woman is not easy, especially because we, we were divorced at the time and I didn't want my husband to know. I didn't want the pity of anyone. And it's been a very lonely path. Suddenly you have, you go from having offices and uh, subsidiaries in the new territory in China and Hong Kong and London and so on, and you have your phone ringing all day long, and you you pray saying, please stop calling me, Virginie, please don't put this person through all the time because she's asking, and so and so, and then suddenly nothing, 
the only thing that kept me, kept me up is that you have to realize we were still having faxes at the same time as email. My assistant, who had been with me for 17 years, printed all messages from all the people who have been working with me or for me for 23 years, 18 years, 22 years. And they were on all the walls at the hospital. And looking at those messages saying, you will be mon patron forever. Uh, you're an awesome woman. You're inspiring me as a mother, and so on. Really, suddenly you realize, okay, maybe I did something well. And they gave me only two years of life expectancy. So this is great because, and I asked to know exactly what was going on. And I said, okay, what will I be able to do, and what's going to happen? And after two years, totally unexpectedly, they told me I was in remission. And on that day, the doctor, you know, very cheerful, said, Mrs. Pointreau, I cannot believe it, blah, 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 it's so great. You're in, in remission. What are you going to do now? Meanwhile, I had started writing books because usually it's very nice, probably therapeutic as well. And I said, I don't have a clue of what I want to do anymore, but I know what I don't want. And my two eldest ones were studying in California. And I decided to pack my in-flight suitcase, ask my youngest one, he was 10 at the time, what he wanted to do. He said, I'm leaving with you. And we left on the following day. Registered it at the French Lycée, because in fact, he was coming from Marymount School, speaking American all day long. And as we were moving to the US, I thought, he will totally forget French. And the French grammar is kind of more than complicated. So while he was you know, studying how to write probably and so on, I thought, there again, having both sides of the Atlantic, the education and the confidence, I thought it was very important. Today he's surfing. He's having a blast in Dallas where he's studying. And I was blessed to have those type of setbacks. It's only in the practice that the lights can go through. If you forget something like this, uh, you don't understand. If you find the solution, and it's, it's been my problem for 23 years, I kind of figure it out quite easily in terms of strategy. It's better when you have little failures, not big ones, but because then you learn and you know how to correct it. But then you have to learn and correct it, which is something we are not implemented, I would say, as a human being to do easily. Uh, the reason why we're so happy is that we made the commitment, each of us, to be part of the other's passion, which we didn't do before. So now, I've been sailing last week. It was uh, Martin Luther King holidays. So for a full week, and now he's here tonight with me, which never happened for decades. So there again, we learn from our mistakes. There again, it wouldn't have been possible previously. And it's a good thing throughout you know, aging. We learn many pieces. We're all puzzles. It takes time to realize that at a certain point, it makes sense. I started in communication, loved it, marketing. I was working for Havis, the number one advertising company at the time. I was earning tons of money, to tell you the truth. I had 25 millions to deal with, launch Oasis, um, soft drinks, Multonen with Lotus, and uh, other brands. Loved it. That's literally. toilet paper, in case yeah. you didn't recognize that. <laughs> and the soft toilet paper. <laughs> yeah. I'm a soft person. Uh, no, but I, I came up to their company, and I said, you know, there's something you have to learn. It, it's not possible in France. You have to improve this. So it, they came up with it. It was great. 
and uh, also at Oasis, we were number one, and we became number one just because um, having a numerous family, seven, my parents had seven children, I had 26 uh, nephews and nieces. Every time you open a bottle of soft drink, it will empty. And I said, why don't you make them two liters instead of one? At the time, one liter was just the size. I said, why do you want us to do that? I said, it won't fit in the fridge. I said, oh, and then if it doesn't fit in the fridge, why do you want us to do that? I said, when it's open, it's going to be finished. The kids are going to finish it over, you know, five o'clock. And I said, okay, they became number one. So just by looking at the market, I was telling you I love, well, I love aromas. I studied perfume making and so on. The thing you have to do throughout your journey professionally is think out of the box. We all agree with this. So one day we acquired 1984 and we acquired Peges. Peges was making liquor, cordials. It wasn't my choice. I'm not really keen on those. Uh, full of sugar. Sometimes the aromas are not natural, blah, blah, blah. And, but they had this very small division making tea and herbal tea. Just because when you're supplying uh, hotel, bar, restaurants, they were always asking for those. And so we were supplying those. And I could see all those women coming to the office with their loose tea or, you know, the bag at the time, they were just an individual. And sometimes they would put in a Tupperware, you know, chamomile and black tea and Earl Grey. Everything smelled the same by the end of the week. So I said, I don't get it. Why do you do that? It's something. I said, well, what would you think about? And I was leaving to eat for, eat for a trip for Italy uh, to develop new decanters that I had designed for, um, oh yeah, I have an Art Deco um, diploma from the Art Deco school here. I love designing. And um, I, I earned three Oscar of packaging. Well, sorry, it's called Oscar. I'm sorry for the American stuff. And one of them was for those because I arrived and met those Italians. And I said, you have those small, two, small um, glass. Could you do one just for plastic or something that would be PT? And said, yes, of course. What are you thinking about? So you know, those loose tea bags, if we could wrap them up individually, would be great. Then the aromas would, wouldn't go away. And I designed, registered the patent, and we had acquired the whole company, Veges, for 12 millions at the time. And we sold the tea and herbal tea division for 12 millions three years after, just due to the patent, to the number one uh, British, in fact, located in, in Netherlands, but it's another story. Um, so think out of the box, and you're going to be successful. Bring ideas from elsewhere. I was just pushing, you know, sorry, at the supermarket, buying the yogurts for the children. And suddenly, mm -hmm. you know how children are, suddenly they just want vanilla, and then suddenly all the children, all their friends are having uh, orchard fruits or red fruits, and they all want the same one. It's really annoying, but it always happened. And so I came back to the office saying, okay, we have to launch tea with aromas into it. Which aromas? Let's follow the trends of the yogurts because they're doing surveys, you know, that's how marketing is doing. They'll, they're investing a lot of money into the, those surveys. Let's, don't do the same one, just use it. And we do. You followed the trends and used the research of the yoga people. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lesson in entrepreneurship right there. Tell us, I think there are students in the, in the audience who are future entrepreneurs, and there are also students in the audience who want to break into the wine and spirits industry. What's your advice to them? OK, uh, first advice, be ready to work. <laughs> no, I, I have to underline it, because um, as I was telling you about mission, goal, and strategy, 
design your mission. We're not all implemented and meant to be CEO because you're very lonely at the top. So be ready for the journey. How do you get ready? First of all, and I know you're very well trained here at AUP, analyze what you're bringing around the table. Where are your skills? Marketing, business strategy, uh, finance can be, you know, different profile. Uh, the tech today, if you're looking at um, LVMH today, since 19, uh, sorry, 2015, they had Ian Rogers uh, responsible for all the new technology who created also Viva Technology because he believed, as I do, that you cannot just talk about new tech today because it's implemented in our daily life and it's gonna be even more implemented. Um, be ready, for example, because you already, we already have it in, in California, in LA, to be driven in a Uber by the car itself. So due to the binding obligation today, mm -hmm you will be sitting, I mean, you will still have a driver sitting next, eventually doing the conversation, but uh, sitting next to the seat, but it's already self-driven. Be ready in 2025 to tick when you're ordering your Uber, do I want a human driver? Or not. Or not. <laughs> so it's very interesting um, I went to CES, we already did this. I have no problem. I don't know if you saw the latest Subaru, the advertising, and I don't like it because it's a young woman shown on the movie, I mean on the advertising uh, video. But they say, okay, we all know our teams, blah, 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 blah. They, they can be distracted very easily, so, uh, and so are we. So you see just a message popping up on her phone. Just for a sec, she's looking, not reading, but just looking at the lights popping up. And then a truck comes in and the car stops. She didn't see it, the truck doesn't hit her. So the reason why I'm mentioning all this is be ready to think out of the box. I said it before. So analyze what you're bringing in. Um, and third thing is your network is your net worth. So be ready to analyze who you know, who you want to meet with. Try to reach them on LinkedIn. It's easy. Uh, a lot of people are ready to answer very easily. Try to understand uh, who could be your mentor. But before reaching the mentor, make sure that you've already analyzed the reason why you're choosing this person and be ready to explain it. Be ready to present, as you're already trained to do here, your goals, what you, why you, you've chosen this topic or another, eventually where you would love to be trained after. I didn't learn all this and all those university within one year or two years or within 10 years. It's something that I've built up throughout my needs or the time I had to dedicate to it. INSEAD was just last year. Because every year, I'm trying to find a topic where I can be challenged and challenge myself on it. Next year is going to be coding. I mean, this year is going to be coding. Uh, I know there are three languages, so I've got plenty of time, three years. Um, but it's interesting. Always challenge yourself. Because you will be challenged by others. Don't let them give you the tempo. Make sure you choose it and do not derive from the mission you have at the beginning. Don't let them drag you to something else. You can try new things, but don't derive to something which is important to you. Um, be ready, apart from new technology, to implement sustainability everywhere. And it goes from luxury goods to anything on a daily basis. And uh, I was complaining the other day 
saying, I do not understand why they did not improve the catamaran just with solar panel to, to make the engine go. I mean, sailing is one thing, but sometimes you, know, you don't have anything going on. You have solar panel, but they are not fulfilling the engine. No one has been thinking about it. We're talking about sailors. They're linked with the earth, the, the sea. It's something I don't get. So it should offer to every one of us, whatever we are wearing, whatever. It, I do not mean you all have to wear you know, uh, something um, which will be totally sustainable. But there again, for example, when we're going sailing, we would never use um, something which is not at least 90 to 95 percent organic because it has to be done that way. When I arrived in the United States, I didn't know anyone. But the only thing I heard nonstop because I was coming out from the hospital is you have to eat or drink organic. I didn't have a clue of what I would be doing. And I thought, okay, I have to reinvest my money in something that never lost money, real estate, Malibu, just because Malibu is such a name and never, you know, decreased in terms of prices. And then I started planning Cabernet Sauvignon and already had a little Pionier. Ended up making seven wines. There are no boom and shelter and so on and they're already pre-sold. But it's terrible. You don't change who you are. So even though I went there and said, you know, I'm totally retired, I'm so happy I've aged, I've learned so much, it's enough, I'm just going to be mentoring. And then I met this woman who created Women of the Vine and Spirits. She had lost everything, and it was uh, 2014. That's when I really obtained, and it was great. Nothing was just known for its... Um, well, mostly famous people, rich and famous people over there. And we obtained the ADA, the official wine appellation, on August 18, 2014. And they didn't have a clue ADA existed. And I explained to the city it would allow, you know, everything to be sustainable. And we would train the people around to be sustainable, only using seaweed products and so on. So of course, my property served as the testimonial, the sample. Everything is organic, dry farming and so on, and we, we had uh, an amazing time doing it. And then women of the Vine and Spirits, women were interested to see what was done and so on. Now it's international, uh, we had a VMH, Panel Ricard, uh, for those who you would know, Bacardi Martini, all those companies uh, working and making sure women are uh, going up and reaching the C-suite. Because every company I went in, I started with women behind the computer being secretary and ended up with 40% of women being at the, what we call CATA, C-suite level. And I think it should be at least our goals as individual to make sure that we are including everyone. We are diversifying whatever the profile, because just like, uh, like Mosaic we were talking about, uh, and the compass we saw um, so just before uh, coming up here. Yeah, it's the same. We're all little pieces but it's what's making uh, life and uh, the world beautiful. I'm gonna turn, thank you. I'm gonna turn it open to the floor now. Does anybody wanna ask a question? Yes. Um, well, first Just speak loud because we don't have a floating mic. Uh, okay. Yeah. So first of all, I um, want to say thank you. This, your speech was great, very inspiring. Um, I admire you and your journey and what you've done. It's absolutely amazing. Um, the question I have, because um, I'm studying art management, and 
I'm really interested in the art world, and um, I've personally have noticed a huge increase in corporate collections of art. And um, well, I unfortunately don't know if your corporation, your companies have any anything in, invested in the art, and if you are interested in it. But my question is, do you think there is future in corporate art collections, and is there? money to make there and is it is it is it a, is it a good thing to invest in and is it interesting in your opinion um if you go back since even before the renaissance you always had corporate whatever corporate meant at the time and the big families uh invested in art so answer is it always existed and my belief is uh, of course a lot of people are investing in it it's um, tricky in some of the contemporary art uh, field, but if you look at all the galleries, and well, I'm, I'm just missing, um, because next week we will have Freeze Los Angeles, for example, happening, but you have also Miami and, and others. So first answer is definitely there will be, and there has always been um, investments from the big corporate. The second thing is, in France, um, the system doesn't allow to be tax de deductible the same way it is in the Anglo-Saxon world. The reason is when you're studying law and having a, a master in law, it's one of the first things you learn. You have the written um, Latin way of looking at law, and the second one, which is the Anglo-Saxon one, which was more verbal. Therefore, we have a reinforced since uh, Louis XIV here in France, but it's true in other uh, places like Italy and Spain and Portugal. It's not tax deductible because the government is concentrating most of the powers, including, and it's a good thing, social support, you know, so, um, Securité Sociale and so on. Uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world, the part done by uh, industries and families and whatever, and not concentrated into the central uh, government, made things uh, easier for uh, art, for investing in art due to the tax deduction they can get from it. So definitely we will see, and it's the same thing in Asia, so definitely we will see a growth in Asia and in the U well in the U.S. It already exists. You cannot go to any university without seeing all those collections uh, sitting there. I remember at Cornell we had Kellogg's and other collections. Um, if you're heading to Dallas, the family invested, and you have amazing collection, you know. Um, featured, and within the, the companies, you can see on the walls those uh, pieces. It was one of my favorite things when I was going to um, my importer in Japan, and you had various suites, and the higher you were heading to, the more paintings you had on the walls. And it was very interesting because I noticed that the contemporary art was at the low, lower levels. The Duenioso and others were then kind of in between all the Impressionism and Van Gogh and all those. And I was discussing with Sophia Noir who is the daughter of the uh, person making movies and uh, granddaughter of the painter. And she opened uh, a new um, exhibit recently. There again, companies gave part of the, their collections to build it up, same at Orsay and uh, others. So how would I, if I were you, develop um, knowledge to be approaching those companies, probably throughout Arcurial, uh, Sotheby's and others. Why? Because 
They are in contact with them all the time. Second, go to, uh, I would say, Artemis, because the Pinot family, as well as um, the Arno family, have been collecting, and they are great collectors. I don't know if you had the opportunity of going to Venice and, and seeing the collections. They're returning all the time. But there again, they have multiple companies. And by just doing um, an internship, a stash, in, into one of their companies, then you can get acquainted with those. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody else have a question? I can drink water then. OK, so nobody? Okay. Yeah. yeah, OK. so much for your speech, very inspiring, just like you said. And I'm going to get quickly to my question. Um, do you ever have, like, in your business investment portfolio, do you ever invest in skincare? I mean, you said something that was really important. Do you ever invest in skincare? And you said important. You said something important that you would, you were looking for a place to put money in that's never lost money. So I'm really interested in what areas you feel uh, like in long term, like ever green, if you say that? Uh, I never invested in skincare for the first uh, answer. Second, uh, and the reason is quite easy. When, I, when you're uh, studying at Izika, you have to make a choice in between perfume making and um, I would say skincare and other cosmetics. Um, the reason why is that, and you, you probably all know this, but perfume, profumum, uh, was mainly to honor the dead. And what happens is that we, they were trying to capture the different aromatic notes, and to do so you have two ways. The first one is to put petals or herbs in contact with grease at the time they were using grease from beef. Sorry, but um, then of course it's it became a little more neutral and others. So you place the petals on uh, the grease and then you filter them, and then you will get something with aromatic notes. You probably read in different books um, the it's called concrete, uh, not concrete, but concrete, and it just meant that. It's uh, a paste made out of this grease with those aromatic notes into it. The other way to capture uh, the aromatic notes is with alcohol. And due to my, to my background and uh, probably my personal uh, sensitivity, I went to the other way, the alcohol. By the way, may I just tell you a, a funny story? I met Jean-Jacques Guerlain at the Commanderie Bonton du Médoc. And he couldn't see at the time, and uh, it happened so that at the age of 15, he really had trouble seeing as well. And so he needed someone when he got on stage, and while we were walking, and then over dinner, he told me the following story. He should have never been at the head of the company. And talking about, you know, setbacks and so on. Because he couldn't see. So that's the reason why his brother was sent to um, business school, whereas he was sent to the grandfather, and the grandfather was making the perfume. So the grandfather would always make sure that he would stay by his side. And he had this luncheon, went to the luncheon, and the grandson stayed by himself. And this truck comes up full of petals, and they said, okay, and it was daffodils and uh, jonqui. And they said, where do we put the merchandise? You know, I have to go and get some more. And he said, oh, this seems to be an empty vat. And the vat was empty, but it had contained jasmine in it. Mm -hmm. So the truck unloads, and the grandfather comes back and says, you've damaged the whole daffodils for the year. Our main perfume right now is Jiki, based on daffodils. We're gonna be totally short of merchandise for a full year. Get out from my office, I don't wanna see you anymore. So 
he doesn't know what to do. He's only 15 or 16 at the time. And he said to his grandfather, how can I make up to you? What can I do? And he said, oh, well, invent it, but get out from my office. And he spends the whole night playing with his tubes. He's a chemist. And, well, that's what he wanted to study. Comes back the next day and comes what, with what we call a mouillette, just, you know, this mini paper. And he puts one under his grandfather's nose and says, what do you think? And the grandfather looks at him and says, where did you find daffodils? I created it. And Jiki was the first perfume totally done from synthesis and not natural aromas issued by Yarmouk. So there again, thinking out of the box. And sometimes you have setbacks, but then you create. So to go back to your question, no, I didn't, and it's not an area I'm very familiar with. Uh, I do not see any, and also inspired by Korean products right now, which are number one on the market, uh, but you know that far better than I do. Uh, I do not see any other uh, products coming out not being organic, uh, based on natural products. The thing is, there are new uh, flowers and herbs uh, discovered every day. Ylang Ylang has been discovered and today is um, farmed by uh, Gehala. And it was really a new thing. I will always remember calling a friend uh, because uh, the, the nurse in chief of the hospital at San uh, told me that she heard this woman talking about perfume making her daughter didn't have a clue what to do, and she decided to go to Izuka, uh, thanks to uh, this woman. And I said, Becky Kanaka, and she said, yes, do you know her? Wait, you're gonna tell her yourself. So I called Betty, who answers, and I said, you know, I have to pass on someone who'd like to say thank you. You've changed life, and the fact that you're working at the hospital is amazing, thank you so much. And she says, do you know where you're calling me? And I said, no. I mean, in India, I just discovered a new flower, a new fragrance. Yeah. So it can still happen. So next thing, if you can come up with new formulas, or, and it's, it's going to be developed. Um, last thing, they had to implement, I believe, new improvement for anti-aging, whatever. Not that it's my topic. But I do believe that prevention from your age is going to allow beautiful women to age beautifully and gracefully. And not only women, I'm very happy to see that men are taking care of their skin today. And uh, I wouldn't like to go back to the 17th or 16th century. Smells were very bad, and that's why perfume was invented. <laughs> Thank you so much.